It's early morning on May 15, 1918, at Outpost 20 in the Argonne Forest, about 120 miles outside of Paris. France's 161st Division is trying to hold the line against the Germans during World War I. The French have had a rough go at it, and they are severely undermanned. So they receive help from the U.S.'s 369th Infantry Division, an all-black unit from New York. Two of its members, Private Needham Roberts and Private Henry Johnson, are on sentry duty. Their job is to keep watch in case anything happens, to which they would alert the rest of the forces. Johnson only enlisted in the Army less than a year ago, around the same time the United States entered the war. And yet he finds himself on the front lines and fighting alongside French soldiers. But not long after the shift begins, they receive sporadic sniper fire. Quickly, Roberts and Johnson begin to stack up boxes of grenades to have ready just in case the Germans advance on their position. Then they begin to hear cutting of the perimeter fence as the Germans begin their assault on the camp. Johnson tells Roberts to go and get help as he begins to throw grenades at the enemy combatants. But not only do the Germans return fire, but they begin to throw grenades at Johnson while aggressively advancing towards his position. When Roberts hears the explosion, he abandons the order and immediately heads back to Johnson. The shrapnel from a German grenade wounds him. And now it's just Private Henry Johnson against about 25 angry and hostile soldiers. The Germans are formidable. They are highly trained and equipped with modern day weaponry. The odds are stacked against Johnson, but the Germans will soon discover just how tough and highly motivated the African-American soldier truly is. We come from innovators, heroes, and royalty. We are our ancestors' greatest hope. We face many challenges, but we mold that adversity into our greatest strength. We are the glue that holds a nation together and allows it to flourish. Welcome to Black is America. The podcast that highlights little known African-American figures and stories that make our history come to life. I'm your host, Dominic Lawson. Episode two, Henry Johnson, the first American hero of World War I. The first time I heard of Henry Johnson was over a year ago when I was researching Lieutenant John Fox, the soldier we featured during season one. And you can see why. But when I read this story, I was like, nah, -uh -uh. nope, no way. There is no way this is real. This is like some real life action hero stuff. But after extensive research, it absolutely is. It was Maya Angelou who said that, quote, courage is the most important of all virtues because without courage, you can't practice any other virtue consistently. And when you learn more about the actions that Uncle Henry took, you can definitely say he displayed those virtues. But who was he? What's his story? Well, Henry Johnson was born on July 15, 1892 in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Now, officially, Winston and Salem were two different municipalities at the time, and they didn't merge until 1913, which is why there's actually a bit of confusion as to where Uncle Henry was born. But he put Winston-Salem on his service record, so that's what we're going to go with. Now, Winston-Salem is home to a few of America's greatest business successes. There is Wachovia Bank that Wells Fargo later acquired. There is also the company that serves as the antagonist of this host's diet. Krispy Kreme Donuts opened its first shop there in 1937 on South Main Street. But then there is probably the biggest thing this area is known for, tobacco. If you're like me and a fan of college basketball, then you are probably familiar with the phrase Tobacco Road, due in large part because of the four major basketball schools in the area that are 25 miles apart on this road. 
Wake Forest, University of North Carolina, Duke University, and North Carolina State. Tobacco Road, or US 15-501, also served as a major roadway for transporting and distributing tobacco for commerce. And one of the most significant users of Tobacco Road was Richard Joshua Reynolds. In our feature on Wendell Scott last season, we mentioned Reynolds Tobacco Company as the title sponsor of NASCAR during Uncle Wendell's era. Today, the R.J. Reynolds Tobacco Company is one of the largest of its kind in the world, and one of the biggest brands it created was Camel Cigarette. But in 1875, this white businessman moved from Virginia to North Carolina to strike out on his own from the family origin business of tobacco. And when you look at his resume, it looks like RJ has some nice bullet points on his application for allyship. Let's see what we got here. Well, for one, he hired 12 African Americans to help him start the company. To be clear, they were employees and not co-founders. There's also the fact that RJ donated the money to start the Slater Industrial School, but you know it today as the HBCU Winston-Salem State University. And as evidence that there is still a connection between Reynolds Tobacco and the school today sits the RJ Reynolds Center, which houses the offices and classrooms of many business disciplines. Reynolds would later donate more money for a structure on campus and become the first Southern white man to establish a hospital primarily for African Americans, the Slater House. Okay, RJ, I see what you're out here doing for the culture during the 1800s. Okay, let me see what else is on this application. Ah, f Hey, Professor Gillespie, as in Presidential Endowed Professor of Southern History at Wake Forest University, Michelle Gillespie, what you got for me? Tell me something about RJ that also has to go on this application. Michelle Gillespie, who was RJ Reynolds? R.J. Reynolds was one of the original tobacco manufacturers in the United States uh, in the late 19th century. He was selling chewing tobacco, and he became the best manufacturer of chewing tobacco in the entire country. How did he become that? He became that because he was the son, the second son out of 16 children of a tobacco planter before the Civil War, who owned uh, over 50 slaves, the largest slaveholder in Patrick County, Virginia. He lived in Kreitz, his father lived in Kreitz, Virginia. And so R.J. Reynolds grew up before the Civil War, born in 1850, uh, and learned the whole, the whole business of growing tobacco. Ooh, that's a big red flag for me, big guy. Yes, R.J. Reynolds was born on the Rock Spring Plantation in 1850. This is clearly where RJ learned everything he knew from the tobacco business. It's probably safe to say 90% of what he learned was from enslaved people. And for this reason, there have been lawsuits of reparations brought against the RJ Reynolds Tobacco Company because of these origins. But RJ didn't own enslaved people himself, and I try not to punish people for what their parents did and focus on their own actions. R.J. was a big advocate of high wages, great working conditions, and shorter hours, which is purely antithetical to the sharecropping practices post-Civil War. So that seems to suggest that the 12 African Americans that he hired to start this global brand may have had really great jobs with good conditions and competitive pay. So in taking all of that into consideration, I think I'm ready to make a ruling here. This application for allyship is hereby approved, but with probationary status. While that enslavement piece is problematic, it wasn't him. He left the plantation legitimately by all accounts and hired African-Americans and dedicated dollars to African-American efforts. If we receive a first-hand account of him opposing slavery, we will take away the probationary status but we have to keep it in place just in case anything comes out. But hey, if there's something you know about R.J. Reynolds and want to add to the record, go to our website, www.blackisamericapodcast.com and leave us a voicemail, and we will update the record and play that in a future episode. On this podcast, we like to give credit where credit is due, but we will absolutely go in on a racist when it's warranted. 
You will see what I mean later when we throw a lot of shade at Leonidas Polk. Trust me, it ties into the Henry Johnson story. And speaking of him, let's get back to Uncle Henry. Now, as a teenager, Henry would move to Albany, New York and do many jobs like a soda mixer, chauffeur, or maybe even a porter. If you're not familiar, a porter was a person who carried luggage for customers at like a railroad station, airport, or a hotel to give you an idea. Henry would make do and keep his job for a while, but I guess he wanted more. And when you are black in the early 1900s in the United States, there are not a lot of prospects for upward mobility. But there was one. The U.S. military has been an avenue for many African Americans to take advantage of just to get a crumb of the pie that is the American dream. For many even today, it's still a vehicle for marginalized communities to advance in a career, and the military depends on that recruitment from these communities. So Uncle Henry, on June 5, 1917, joins the New York National Guard 15th Infantry Regiment, but that designation would soon change. See, during this period, World War I was raging in Europe and the United States took a mostly isolationist approach to the war. The sentiment by many Americans was basically, that's their problem. Keep that energy on that side of the Atlantic. But let's keep it real for a second. There was also politics at play as Woodrow Wilson was up for re-election in 1916 and needed the support of Americans who supported both sides of the conflict. But see, on January 19, 1917, German Foreign Minister Arthur Zimmerman attempts to send a, quote, cryptic message to Mexico, stating that if they went to war with the Americans, it would support them and recognize Texas, New Mexico, and Arizona as part of Mexico. Now, I say air quotes when I say cryptic message because you would think that since it was such a high-level diplomatic message that it would be treated as such. You know, like some secret messaging back channel so that it wouldn't get, you know, intercepted or maybe even some type of invisible ink or something. But nope, it was sent in the same manner that a set of new parents in, say, Chicago would get a message out to their parents in, say, Denver and Houston to let them know they are new grandparents during the early 1900s. And if you guessed Western Union, then you would be correct. But that's not even the worst of it. In 1917, you could easily send a telegram from Germany to Mexico with no problem. But in order to do that, it had to make one tiny stop. And that's in London, which is the capital of one of Germany's main enemy combatants in World War I. So as you can imagine, British naval intelligence intercepts this message and decodes it before allowing it to go to Mexico. If you want to see the actual telegram, we have a link in the show notes of your podcast player. On February 24th, President Wilson receives what would become to be known as the Zimmerman telegram. And a few days later, on March 1st, the telegram was shared with the American press. And from there, the American sentiment towards joining World War I began to shift. You know, I don't get it. When I study the history of this country, I don't understand this one thing. Time and time again, people want to test the United States. I mean, there are two things this country does well when you study it. Unfortunately, one of those things is racism, and as a nation, we should really have a serious conversation about doing something about that. But the other is military engagement. I know the Germans was on this whole world domination tip, but why try the Americans? And one thing Americans do not like is feeling challenged because they will rally behind a cause. David Kahn, author of The Code Breakers, The Story of Secret Writing, said that, quote, no other single cryptanalysis has had such enormous consequences. And he said, quote, never before or since has so much turned upon the solution of a secret message. So it goes without saying, the American people were angry because they wanted to stay out of this war. But the Germans, 
were trying to bring the fight to American soil by proxy of the Mexican military. Well, the Americans felt that the time for isolation was over. And on April 6, 1917, the United States Congress declares war on Germany and its allies. Yep, it was time for the Americans, as we say in Memphis, Tennessee, to hop off the couch and whoop that trick. Now, to be fair, the goal of the Germans wasn't really to have Mexico defeat the United States because that wasn't going to happen. I mean, first of all, the Mexicans did not like the U.S., but they were in the middle of a civil war. Their economy was crap, and any support that the Germans would send was expected to be blocked by the British naval blockade. No, the Germans just needed the Mexicans to delay the Americans from coming to the aid of the British and the French for as long as possible. But due to the foreign minister's screw-up, that meant Uncle Henry and his now redesignated 369th Infantry Division were coming across the pond. But if they thought they were going to fight initially, they would be sadly disappointed. Because I know this sounds like a broken record now, but due to military policy, the army was not integrated. This means not only would they get little to no combat training, but they would be reduced to doing jobs like maintenance, cooking, digging ditches, or digging latrines. But that would change very soon. The French Army's 161st Division was in need of reinforcements. They were taking heavy casualties from the Germans. So in a deal with General John Pershing, the 369th would be attached to the French Army Division in the Champagne region of France in the Argonne Forest. This helped out General Pershing in an effort to keep his troops happy because many of them did not want to serve or fight with African-American soldiers. However, he would also call himself giving the French a warning to working with the 369th. He said that they lacked, quote, civic and professional conscience and were a, quote, constant menace to the American. Is that right, General Pershing? Okay, okay. Well, the French soldiers did not care about any of this at all. As a matter of fact, the French throughout history have been very pleasant to African Americans. We talked about it in our feature on Marian Anderson last season. But let me be clear. I'm not saying that racism did not exist in France. What I am saying is that they were not hung up on it like we were here in the United States. And that's a good thing because the French were in need of help and they would get it just in time as the 369th were attached to the French in April of 1918. Which brings us to the early morning hours of May 15th. Members of the 369th, Private Henry Johnson and Private Needham Roberts, are on guard duty in the wee hours of the morning at Outpost 20 in the Argonne Forest. They were slated for a four-hour shift from 12 a.m. to 4 a.m. Roberts grew up in Trenton, New Jersey, and like Johnson, was in the service industry back home, first as a hotel bellhop and later as a drugstore clerk. But unlike Johnson, he actually shouldn't be there. I say that because Roberts told a little fib in order to enlist, because while Johnson is just shy of his 26th birthday, Roberts is only a 16-year-old soldier. Now, Johnson would later say he thought it was, quote, crazy to have two untrained soldiers on sentry duty. However, when you know the African-American experience, you know that sometimes we have to do the most with the least. Which is why Johnson told a corporal that while he did not feel prepared, that he and Roberts would, quote, tackle the job. So they were given French weapons, helmets, and learned enough French to be able to alert command in case anything went down. And not long after the shift began, activity was certainly pick up. Because little did they know that German forces were preparing a surprise attack. German snipers would begin firing on their positions. So Johnson and Roberts began stacking boxes of grenades in their dugout to be ready. Then, a little after 2 a.m., Johnson heard what he later described as, quote, snipping and clipping near the perimeter fence. 
Johnson begins to throw grenades towards the fence line. He tells Roberts to go and alert the troops that they were under attack as he stays behind to fend off the Germans. Johnson continues to throw grenade after grenade, but the Germans are returning fire and throwing grenades of their own. Chalk it up to not receiving proper training or youth, Roberts never makes it to the other soldiers and runs back to Johnson's position to help. But soon he was hit with shrapnel from a German grenade. He is hurt badly, receiving wounds to his hip and arm. Not only is he in no position to get help, but he is also in no position to fight. The best he can do is assist Johnson as he takes on an estimated 25 Germans by himself. Johnson holds out as long as he can, but there are simply too many German soldiers. They are literally coming from every direction. He continues throwing grenades until he runs out. Private Johnson is then hit by German rounds in the head and in the lip, but he continues to fight shooting his rifle into the dark of night. He takes more wounds in his side and his hand, but he keeps fighting. The Germans are right on top of him now. The last round he shot was so close, it was muzzle to chest. Next, and once again, you can probably chalk this up to either lack of training or just under epic duress, because Johnson attempts to load his French rifle with an American cartridge, which leads to the obvious weapon filler. At this point, Johnson is surrounded by Germans with no ammunition and no grenades, but he keeps fighting. He grabs the barrel of his rifle and begins to swing it like a club. He gives one German a massive blow to the head and he goes down, but it splinters the rifle. Now Private Johnson has no grenades and no rifle to fend off the Germans. He is knocked to the ground and suddenly he sees two enemy combatants grab Roberts in an effort to take him prisoner. All appears to be lost for the two Americans. Private Johnson was put in a very difficult situation, untrained and put on the front lines against a very tough enemy. At the fact that Johnson is five foot four inches and 130 pounds, and that doesn't exactly help either. All signs should point to him losing this fight and ultimately his life. But there is something deep down inside of us in our community that just never gives up, especially when it comes to military conflict. It dates back to Africa that had some of the fiercest warriors in the history of combat. The Zulu and Nubian nations come to mind. And sometimes you have to summon the fighting spirit of the ancestors to remind the enemy that you will not simply go quietly into the night. Whether it be in the field of sports, the fight for civil rights, or during World War I, you have to show people who you are. And that reminds me of something Medal of Honor recipient Captain Florent Groberg said, quote, what I represent, not as an individual, but as a countryman, is stronger than what you represent. And today, I will show it to you. And in the early morning of May 15th in a French forest, as it relates to Private William Henry Johnson, as we say in my culture, those Germans f***ed around and found out. Seeing his friend about to be taken, Johnson takes out his last weapon, his army-issued bolo knife. Johnson gets off the ground and runs towards Robert's position. The Germans are stunned to see this black man come towards them, wounded multiple times over, charging. They get off a clean shot on Johnson, but it doesn't matter. Once he gets to Robert's position, he plunges the bolo knife into the head of a German soldier, turns to another one, and literally disembowels him and gets Roberts over to safety. Johnson would later say, every slash meant something. Believe me, I was not doing exercises, let me tell you. Johnson takes another pistol shot in the arm from a lieutenant and then a German jumps on his back. Johnson drives the bolo knife into the ribs of the soldier, shakes him off, 
and then goes after the lieutenant and kills him. He goes back to Roberts and drags him further to safety as French and American reinforcements finally arrive to the trench after hearing all of the commotion. The Germans begin to retreat. Seeing help finally come, I imagine the adrenaline finally wears off for Johnson as he collapses to the ground. But the job was done. Private William Henry Johnson, while engaged in hand-to-hand -hand combat, single-handedly stopped the Germans from breaking the French line. As the sun rose, there was clear evidence of what happened. There was blood and abandoned weapons all over the battlefield. Johnson, against all odds, killed four Germans and wounded between 10 and 20 more. Johnson would wake up in a field hospital. Yeah, you heard me right. Private Johnson lived through that endeavor. Next, you might be wondering, how many wounds did he have? The answer 21. Johnson suffered 21 wounds in what the French would later call, quote, the Battle of Henry Johnson. Johnson, obviously, is deemed a hero. The French agreed. They awarded him and Roberts the Croix de Guerre, France's highest military honor, while Johnson received the additional gold palm with his medal for extraordinary valor. He is even given the terrifying nickname, the Black Death. Johnson, Roberts, and the rest of the 369th would return home in 1919 after the war. However, many of them did not return empty-handed, as they were not seen as equal to white soldiers and not given proper training. The 369th returned home with 171 recipients of the Croix de Guerre. They, like Johnson, were also given a nickname due to their courage and valor, but also their ferocity in battle. But it came from their enemy, the Germans. They were called Helen Kempfar, which in German means Hellfighter, which is why we know the 369th today as the Harlem Hellfighters. But what about back home? How would the now promoted Sergeant Henry Johnson be received? It was without question that he made his mark. President Theodore Roosevelt says he is one of the five bravest Americans to serve in World War I. Well, he, along with the rest of the 369th, were given a parade in their honor on Fifth Avenue in New York City. Sergeant Johnson's face was plastered all across the country for the purposes of ramping up recruitment and Uncle Henry was also touring across the country sharing his story in paid speaking engagements. This was all nice, very nice indeed. He has fame, some money in his pocket to take care of his family, but nah, something is missing. As a matter of fact, a few things are missing. Shouldn't there be a few more pieces of hardware to accompany his French medal? but this time from his home country? Hold on, cut the music real quick. Let me take a look at Sergeant Johnson's discharge papers for a second. Let's see here. Da, 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 da. Whoa, 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 whoa. There's some missing information here. See, I knew some bull was coming around the corner. When we look at his war record, his actions of what he did on May 15th, 1918 are nowhere to be found. It's like as if everything I just told you about Sergeant Johnson never happened, which means if they are not in there, then the 21 wounds that he suffered aren't in there either, which means no distinguished service cross, no purple heart, or quite possibly the Medal of Honor. Even if not for the accolades, this is significant for another reason, his injuries. If there is no mention of his injuries, then he is not able to collect disability allowance, and his speaking engagements dried up when he gave a talk in St. Louis. He was supposed to talk about racial harmony in the military, but Uncle Henry kept it real and instead discussed how badly African Americans in segregated units 
were being abused and mistreated, and this led to a warrant for his arrest for wearing the uniform beyond the prescribed date, which means that Sergeant Henry Johnson had to go back to being a porter. The job now proved difficult due to those injuries. And from there, things got worse. He turned to drinking, which led to his wife and three kids leaving him. Eventually, he would get a permanent and total disability rating and receives monthly pension for tuberculosis. But by then, it was too late, and his health was in rapid decline. And on July 1st, 1929, Sergeant Henry Johnson dies from myocarditis in Washington, D.C. He was 32 years old. When you hear stories like these, there is a question that comes up often. How come we as African Americans go so hard for a country that doesn't always love us back? I have asked this question often. I'm sure you have as well. I'm sure even if you are white and listening to this podcast, you may have asked this question also. But allow Andre Johnson, portrayed by actor Anthony Anderson, from the American Broadcasting Company and Emmy Award winning television series Blackish, who is speaking to white male colleagues just after the election of President Trump. I think he has a great answer to this question. He said, quote, I love this country even though at times it doesn't love me back. For most black people, this system has never worked for us, but we still played ball even though we tried our best to live by the rules, even though we knew they would never work out in our favor. Black people wake up every day believing our lives will change, even though everything around us says it's not. I love this country as much, if not more, than you do. End quote. Dre, I could not agree more, my man. Relatively, though, you have to remember that the United States is a very young country. When you think about the countries in Europe, some dating back to the first century, only being 246 years old makes you kind of a child. And like a child, you are trying to figure out some things. What is right or wrong? What is good or evil? But as you grow and know better, you tend to start to do better. Now, the United States is nowhere near being this racial utopia, but it has began to right a few wrongs. And for Uncle Henry, it can't bring him back, but we can surely restore his legacy. Which is why in 1996, President Clinton posthumously awarded him the Purple Heart. That is a great start, but he needs something else. Which is why in 2002, the U.S. Army posthumously awarded him the Distinguished Service Cross for his valor on the battlefield. That is a great honor. Like we said in our feature on John Fox, it's the second highest honor for valor in our country. But nope, still not enough. Think about what he did. He single-handedly, through mostly hand-to-hand -hand combat, held the French line against approximately 25 German soldiers, saving his own fellow soldiers, all while sustaining 21 wounds. Now this calls for something more. That no one who serves our country should ever be forgotten. We are a nation, a people, who remember our heroes. This man gave everything he had for his fellow soldier and his country. He deserves to be honored properly. We take seriously our responsibilities to only send them when war is necessary. We strive to care for them and their families when they come home. We never forget their sacrifice. And we believe that it's never too late to say thank you. That's why we're here this morning. Sergeant Henry Johnson should get all of his flowers. And on May 14th, 2015, a legacy was cemented for a kid from Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. In the early hours of May 15th, 1918, Henry Johnson became a legend. Henry was one of the first Americans to reap France's highest award for valor. But his own nation didn't award him anything. Not even the Purple Heart. 
though he had been wounded 21 times. Now, America can't change what happened to Henry Johnson. We can't change what happened to too many soldiers like him who went uncelebrated because our nation judged them by the color of their skin and not the content of their character. But we can do our best to make it right. In 1996, President Clinton awarded Henry Johnson a Purple Heart. And today, 97 years after his extraordinary acts of courage and selflessness, I'm proud to award him the Medal of Honor. But if a senior senator from New York gets his way, the accolades will not stop there. U.S. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, who represents the state of New York, home of the Harlem Hellfighters, and who was a big advocate for Henry Johnson to get all the accolades he have gotten so far, has called for the renaming of a military base in Uncle Henry's honor. This comes after Congress authorized the Naming Commission to provide new names for U.S. military bases and other Department of Defense assets originally named for Confederate leaders. One of those installations is Fort Polk, a military installation in Louisiana. It's currently named after Leonidas Polk. Remember I told you earlier I was going to throw some shade at old Pokey? Well, here it comes. Leonidas Polk was a traitor and a Confederate general who actually was an incompetent commander and hated taking orders. Why anyone would want to name a U.S. military installation after a terrible leader is beyond me. But get this, that's not even the worst of it. And what I'm about to tell you, I am not making it up. Why would you name a military installation after a guy that was injured from his own cannon blowing up? I'm not lying, y'all. While doing a demonstration and due to improper handling of a cannon called Lady Polk after his wife, the cannon explodes and blows the clothes off of Polk and injuring his eardrums. Also, that blast killed seven of his own men. So yeah, I think going with Sergeant Johnson and renaming it Fort Johnson is the better call. But getting back to real heroes, the 369th proved that they were just as good, if not better, soldiers than their counterparts. They served 191 days in World War I, which is the longest period of any other unit from America. We already mentioned the 171 Croix de Guerre, but there were also many who were honored with the Distinguished Service Cross. Also, add the fact that they never lost a man to enemy capture. The 369th and what they did in World War I helped to firmly establish the U.S. as the military superpower it is today. And just for kicks, it was also the 369th military band that introduced a new sound never heard before in France. It's called jazz. But it goes without saying that the crown jewel is this unit's only Medal of Honor recipient, Henry Johnson who did not let the color of his skin deter him from achieving the mission. The proud Southerner from North Carolina proved that when the chips are down, that the African-American soldier, while under duress, is resourceful, courageous, and is willing to do whatever it takes to complete the goal and look out for his fellow countrymen. And that is how Sergeant William Henry Johnson became the first American hero of World War I. The Black is America podcast, a presentation of Owl's Education, was created and is written, researched, and produced by me, Dominic Lawson. Executive producer, Kenda Lawson. Cover art was created by Alexandria Eddings of Art Life Connections. Sources to create this episode include whitehouse.gov, history.com, Smithsonian Magazine, the Department of Defense, the National Museum of African American History and Culture, the National Archives, and C-SPAN. For a complete list of sources, look in the show notes of your podcast player or our website, www.blackisamericapodcast.com. The quote from Blackish is courtesy of Calibu Inc. Society, Cinema Gypsy Productions, Principato Young Entertainment, and Artists First, and is distributed by Disney ABC Domestic Television. 
The instrumental for the song Whoop That Trick is courtesy of the record label Grand Hustle. The song is written by Al Capone and performed in the movie Hustle and Flow by Terrence Howard. Be sure to like, review, and subscribe to the Black is America podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you like to listen to podcasts. Also, let people know what you think about the show. We would greatly appreciate that. For a full transcript of this episode and other resources, go to www.blackisamericapodcast.com. There, you can read our blog, leave us a review, or you can leave a voicemail where you can ask a question or let us know what you think about the show that we may play in a later episode. You can also hit the donation button if you like what you heard, which helps us to create more educational content like this. So that's going to do it for Black History Month, but don't think for one second that we are done. We have so many more amazing stories to tell you this season throughout the year. Make sure you are subscribed to the Black is America podcast as we release more content leading to our season finale this September. Thank you so much for listening to the award-winning Black is America podcast, where our history comes to life. Until next time.